الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونتوب إليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا وسيئات أعمالنا من يهدي الله فهو المهتد ومن يدلك فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن محمدا أبده رسوله بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين عامنوا اتقوا الله حق اتقاته ولا تقلتن إلا أنتم مسلمين and my bad. I, I always start my buddhas with this ayah from, from the Quran and I've heard lots of others also start it and I find it very scary. Inshallah, with the permission of Allah, one day I will do a khutba dedicated just to this ayah. I'm not prepared yet. I'm still contemplating on it. But what I find amazing is that the ayah tells us not to die as non-Muslims. But the ayah is addressing Muslims. So it starts by saying, Ya ayyuhadazina amanu. And then it says, Do not die unless you are Muslim. So the possibility that you can lose your faith after having submitted. And the words that are used here are not submission, but actually iman. So it's addressing those who have iman. They are, uh, in a theological sense, even more believing than those who have submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The daraja of a mu'min is higher than the daraja of a Muslim. And so it is addressing this category of people, that those who have submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and those in whose heart Iman has already alived, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is warning them, be careful, do not die without faith. What it means is that even after you have submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, even after you have believed in Him, you are convinced that there is a God, that is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the one God, you still have a chance of losing that faith. But what is further more scary about it is that you don't know when you are going to die. So I could pop off before I finish this Pata, if Allah so wishes. Which means, because you don't know when you are going to die, any moment can be a death, which means every moment of your life should be spent in such a way that you are guarding your iman. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing believers and saying, do not die as unbelievers, which means you spend every moment of your life anticipating that and trying to protect your iman. I teach at the university and every semester I get at least one or sometimes two students who come to me, who are usually non-Muslims, and say, we want to do a paper on evil. It is very interesting how a lot of people in this society are fascinated with evil. They want to understand what is evil, uh, what is the nature of evil, especially within the Islamic sources. So sometimes they say, I want to understand the concept of evil in the Quran, or I want to understand uh, evil as Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, has understood or explained. And I have a very standard answer. I said, if you want to write a paper on evil, I recommend you go to the philosophy department and write a paper on nothing. And that kind of puzzles them. They said, what do you mean, evil? I tell them that there is no such thing as evil. You cannot reflect and write upon something that does not exist. And which is very puzzling because a lot of people who have not understood the essence of the Islamic faith think of evil as a thing that exists by itself out there. And in many other religions, evil is an anti-God force. To assume that there is an independent force out there which can even dare to challenge Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is shirk. Because there cannot be two supernatural sources of power. All power belongs to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Everything that is created has been created by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. At some point there was nothing and the only thing that existed was Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So even if there is such a thing as evil, it does not exist by itself. It exists by the will and permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That is an important thing to understand. And sometimes these deep philosophical issues are explained very simply. For example, when you read the Surah Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Fala'azubira bin Fulah, Min Shari'ah Allah. You are saying, say, 
I seek refuge in the Lord of the dawn from the evil that he has created. From the evil that he has created. It's a very difficult concept for a lot of people to understand, especially today when people see egregious crimes, when they see genocides, when they see war, when they see plague, and lots of people dying. They begin to question the very existence of God and say, the presence of so much evil in the world suggests to them that there is no God. When in fact, it is the opposite true. In a philosophical sense, there is no, like take the example of light and darkness, which is what traditional Islamic scholars, the Mutakallimun, the philosophers and jurisprudence, everybody use the example of light and darkness to explain that there is no such thing as darkness. Darkness is merely the absence of light. Like, if we are going for a walk in the forest at night, I can tell all of you, bring light with you. So you can bring candles, you can bring torch, you can bring various sources of power to bring light. But you can't tell anybody, bring darkness with you. Because there is no such thing as darkness. Darkness exists only in the absence of light. Similarly, evil exists only in the absence of good. <coughs> we can bring higher. When the higher disappears, what you see is evil. When goodness it rolls from society, from our behavior, from our heart. When goodness begins to disappear from our hearts, from our interactions, from our muamalas, from our society, what you see is evil. Now that is an important thing, and this metaphor of light is very important. Uh, in Surah Nur, we know that Allah Nur of Samawati wal Earth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes himself as the light of heavens and the earth. And so there are lots of Muslims have built a lot of philosophies, the uh, Ishraqi philosophy, etc. It's all based on this idea that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is light. We also have the notion the Prophet is light also coming from the Quran. So it is when we forget Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that there is evil and there is darkness. But the puzzle becomes even more complicated because if we say that evil is the absence of God or the absence of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, how can we even imagine a space where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is absent because by definition he is everywhere. So Allah is everywhere and there is nowhere that he is not there. So how can there be evil? It's like a puzzle. So first we say, okay, we try to understand evil by saying evil is that where there is no God. And then, but Allah is everywhere. You, you, Allah doesn't have a zip code or an address that you go looking for, and He's closer to us than even our jugular way. People say that take the mess out of your heart, and what will be left is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because He's already there with us. So, so then what is this? How can we imagine absence of goodness and absence of God in order to understand the evil that we see in the world? And for that, you have to understand that A, nothing, nothing at all happens without the will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nothing happens without the will of subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is only with the permission of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that some unfortunate beings are granted the permission to forget Allah. They become ghafla. And this ghafla is evil. So it is like you're sitting with Allah, Allah is in you, and you forget that Allah is in you, and that spiritual absence of Allah is evil. That is the only way we can conjure the idea of evil in this world. Take the case of Iblis. When Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created Adam alayhi salam, there were celebrations in the heavens. There were celebrations in the heavens. There was a great party. God had now created his vice student on earth. But also importantly, he had created the best of creations. Ashraf al makhluqat The human being is the best thing that God has created according to God himself. So there was this party. 
And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then ordered all his angels to bow before Adam. Iblis refused to do that. It's a very interesting situation because we don't really know what the ontological status of Iblis is, whether he's a jinn or whether he is an angel, because he's made of fire, and the Quran also says that angels are made from fire. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in these three places in the Quran, says, I asked the angels to bow before Adam, and Iblis refused. So he was. So the complicated answer is that even though by Fitra, he was a jinn by status, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has raised his status to be included among the angels because he had worshipped Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for, for a long, long time. And Iblis disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punished him for his arrogance by kicking him out of the hold of eternity and heaven and said, one day you will be punished. Now this is a very interesting puzzle. Even though simplistically we understand that the sin that Iblis committed was that of arrogance, Muslim scholars have also tried to understand it differently in a positive light, actually arguing that maybe Iblis is the only true monotheist the only entity who would bow only before Allah and he would not bow before anybody else. So he said, Allah, you are only Iyakanabadu. It is only you to whom we worship. How can we worship this thing of clay that you made? You know, Adam made of clay is, is like the idols that people make, which are also of clay in most parts of the world. So how could I worship this idol? But that is not the point. The point is that even at that moment after worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for eternity, Iblis in his heart had an identity of himself. He had an ana. He said, it is I. I am made of fire. I am superior to this entity made of clay. Whereas everybody else was in a state of fana, including Jibril. They have no identity. Allah says, bow, they bow. So their bowing to Adam is not bowing to Adam, but it is a reminder that they have submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and whatever Allah wants from them, they will. If Allah says die, they will die. If Allah says live, they will live. If Allah says bow, they will bow. So it's a very interesting contrast. But it is also perhaps the birth of evil in this universe. When Iblis has refused to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's command. So evil in a way was born with Adam. Because the birth of Adam inspired the emotions of jealousy, the arrogance and disobedience in Iblis. And he refused to bow. But what is interesting is what is hidden in this arrogance is the idea that he had will, free will, and choice. That Adam, that Iblis had the choice to disobey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even at that time. So today, as human beings, we must realize that our biggest threat and danger is the fact that as human beings, we have choice. I sometimes wish that I was a tree or a stone. And I didn't have the will to choose, because when we choose, we run the risk of making a choice which may displease the last one. <coughs> there is an interesting ayah in the Quran, uh, in Surah Anbiya, which says, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim, Kullu nafsin da'iqatul maut. Every soul will taste death. But now, lukum bishakri wa qayrin fitnatan. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, we will test you all with evil and with good. And of course, wa ilayna turju. And of course, all of you have to return to me. Now, this is a very interesting session in which both test, evil, and death are included. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we will test you. The word fitna is that means many things and we often use it in terms of chaos and political unrest. But fitna actually means trial. It is a period of trial. 
is a period of test. And Allah will test us with fitna, will test us with good and with evil. So those who are safe, especially this is very pertinent to Muslims in America who live in prosperity and peace and security compared to our brothers and sisters say, oh, are today or in Syria or in other parts of the world where they both these conditions, those who are facing our trials, they are not rewards or punishments, they are both tests. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is testing us by giving us peace and prosperity. He wants to know what we can do for Him in gratitude. And when He's testing us with trials, He's trying to test us how strong our faith is. That even in the face of severe adverse circumstances, do we still remember Him? who will still forget him. And that trial is what I want to talk about. We can think, you know, for, for the ability to think. You must understand that it is very difficult to imagine and talk about Allah because He is like nothing that we know of. So we can only have approximate conversations about the fitwa and the attributes of Allah from what little is revealed to us in the Quran. And so in that order, we try to grasp this idea of what, what is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala testing. Similarly with Satan. I find it useful to think of Satan as a three-headed monster. Imagine a monster, now as everybody watches animation stuff and there's a lot of monsters available on your internet. Take a look at a three-headed monster. One monster represents challenges which are internal to us, which are threats which are internal. One head represents threats which are external to us. And one head represents those challenges and those threats which are eternal. Internal, external, and eternal. For example, if you look at the seerah of Rasulullah the mushrikeen of Mecca were challenges and threats were outside, outside the community, especially when they were in Medina. The challenge was an external challenge, it was an external threat manifest in the several wars that were waged against Mecca. The internal challenge came primarily from the Munafiqin. And the Munafiqin were so good in their hypocrisy that even the Prophet could not identify who was, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala had to actually tell him that these are the Munafiqin. So the external threat was the Mushrikeen, the internal threat were the Munafiqin, and the eternal threat was Jahiliyyah. The state of ignorance. Jahiliyyah is the unawareness of God. Not just knowledge. You could have knowledge of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if someone stopped. XYZ on the road and he could recite to you all the 99 names of Allah and lots of other things. But that is not just Jahiliyyah. Jahiliyyah means to exist even for a moment if you have existed without the awareness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you are in a state of Jahil. That Ghafla that I'm talking about, being Ghafil, even if you have knowledge but you are a Ghafil of Allah, that your heart or your consciousness is not making zikr then remember that you are in a state of Jahiliyyah. And that is our eternal and permanent challenge. Even when we become Muslims, even when we have submitted to Allah Ta'ala, even when our heart is filled with Iman, this, this possibility of becoming ghafil exists. That's why Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala says, وَلَا تَمُوتُنَّ إِلَّا أَنْتُمْ مُسْلِمِينَ Do not die unless you are constantly aware of it. For example, all of us wish that when we die, we recite the kalima, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, let it be on our lips. How will it come out? How will it come out of your mouth if you don't? I could not say waliyan murshida, it never came out of my mouth. So every time I give a khutbah, all the way while driving, I keep reciting in my mouth so it comes out easily when I'm standing here. Right? So if you want at the moment of crisis, at the moment of your death, for that thing to come out of your mouth, La ilaha illallah, 
Keep reciting it all the time. You're walking back to your car, you're driving, etc. Always, always. For that, you will also have to be in the state of Buddha. That is what being prepared to die as a Muslim is all about. Not becoming Muslim. That is the eternal challenge for everybody. This fear of Ghasla and Jahiriyyah was a challenge to Muslims, to the first Muslims, and it is a challenge to us, and will remain a challenge to all Muslims eternally. What will change only is external and internal challenges. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen wa salatu wa salam wa rasuli. Today for American Muslims, I want to very briefly tell you what three challenges that we really face now. Our external challenges are twofold. One is that which we face in our society, in our environment, and those that come from environments far away. So for example, the politics and the reality of the Middle East remains a challenge to Muslims here today and the politics of this country. Islamophobia is completely on the rise steadily. I remember writing an article just three years ago about Islamophobia, and I found it very interesting that the favorability ratings of Muslims in this country was higher than only atheists. So I remember saying that only atheists are not looked up positively as Muslims are today. But the latest surveys show that we have also fallen below that. Only 40% of Americans have some, a positive view of Muslims. At least the majority of Americans today have a very negative view of it. Uh, you may want to reject it. You may want to say they are prejudiced, they are bad, people evil, etc. Whatever mechanism you use to cope with this reality, remember it will affect you. It will affect your children in their schools. Today, according to CARE, 50% of Muslim students are suffering from bullying. That means if you have two kids, at least one of them is being bullied, primarily because he or she is a Muslim. People are losing their jobs, finding it difficult to get new jobs in a tough economy. And even people who have as secure jobs as tenured professors are losing it in transition the case of the Palestinian professor at the University of Illinois, Albana Champagne, if you are following it. So this external challenge is Islamophobia. And Islamophobia is like a gas, a poisonous gas. Even if you have an airtight room, if it enters one place, it is everywhere. Remember that. It is not something, we live in a globalized world, and in this globalized world, it's like every room is connected to another room. So if this poisonous gas enters one room, it will go to all other rooms. So if Islamophobia starts in India or Europe or Africa, don't think we are insulated from it. It will come to us also. Which means that not only do we have to combat it here, we have to combat it everywhere. So we challenge Islamophobia here, in the U.S., in our neighborhood, don't say, oh, I don't experience that in Delaware, alhamdulillah, this is a blue state. No, even if it's happening in Pennsylvania or New Jersey, it will creep and affect us and our lives, and it is our responsibility. If we are secure, it is our responsibility to help those who are insecure, and if we are insecure, then it is our responsibility to work with those who are already secure. So the external threat that I think American Muslims and all Muslims really fear face today is Islamophobia. And Islamophobia can have various manifestations. It is not just negative views of Islam. It can lead to action, it can lead to violence, and it can even lead to wars and bombings, and etc. The internal challenges that we face are different. Different Muslim communities have different challenges. We are very, very diverse. We are nearly one-fourth of the world, 1.6 billion Muslims. So the internal challenges of Muslims in Turkey are significantly different from internal challenges of Muslims in Egypt. And even from Muslims in the United States, the internal challenges that we face in our communities are very different. What we face in Delaware are different from what people face in, say, Washington, D.C. And it's up to you to reflect on what are the internal challenges. There are two threats that I see that we should be alert to. I'm not saying that those things already exist in our communities. 
I see them affecting other communities. And those two things are, one is sectarianism, and the other is intolerance of people's different beliefs. If you see Muslims practicing Islam slightly different from you, don't assume you are right and they are wrong every time. Try to bring compassion and understand. If you think they are wrong, try to dialogue with them. If they still do not dialogue, leave them alone. Prophet said, Kul khayran aw ismuk. Say nice things or shut up. This is exactly what the Rasulullah said. Say nice things or shut up. So if nothing nice to say about others, then leave them alone. It can lead to conflict unnecessarily. This is not a state time to start internal conflicts over minor issues. The second threat is sectarianism. Alhamdulillah, it has not yet affected Muslims in North America. Lots of initiatives have been taken. I would recommend that there, I can see some of the leaders of the community here to actually start a dialogue on these issues preemptively. Those are some internal threats. The eternal threat, like I said, is about forgetting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And I hope that all of us, at least from this khutbah, will take home these simple messages. Try to minimize the time when you don't remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And with that, I think I'm running out of time. I will stop. Thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for giving me this opportunity to share these views with you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim.